Uh, and I'm here. Uh, right, lovely stuff. Thank you. Let's start with the stories, though, that are making headlines. Uh, to do that, we've got Camilla Tomini and Ashley James. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning both of you. Just before we get to the first story, don't forget we'd love to hear what you think of them, and you can tell us by scanning the QR code on screen now and sending us a WhatsApp. Uh, but we were talking marathons, Ashley. Just firstly, I saw your Instagram. Big weekend in your house. Did your daughter work, walk for the yeah, first time? Yeah, she did. Time? She Aww. did. And uh, we've been nailing potty training for my son as well. So double whammy. Big weekend. Yeah. Well but I, I was done. very pleased not to be running a marathon. And well done to everyone. <laughs> I've done getting... two before, Have but you? yeah, pleased it wasn't me. <laughs> but, but getting when the, those moments, those first, the child first walks is just mm. one of those extraordinary things. It's like watching someone cross the marathon finishing line. You get oh, so emotional. Yeah, it's amazing. And then you spend the next few months just constantly <laughs> bend <laughs> yeah. over yourself trying to catch them and make sure they don't hit a well, corner. Congratulations. Thanks. Well done. Um, so, look, let's start with the first story today, Camilla. And it's, it's, it's a complicated one just mm. in terms of the Palestinian march that happened on the weekend and some footage that was released, uh, which the... Prime Minister described as appalling treatment with regards to this, the Jewish man who's at the centre of the protest. Um, I think we've got some of the footage sure. that happened. It was, it was somebody who was walking along. He'd just come from the synagogue. He wanted to cross across the, the route of the mm -hmm. protest and a police mm -hmm. officer was trying to help him find a way round it. However, he didn't necessarily use the best language to do it. This is what was posted. You are quite openly Jewish. This is a pro-Palestinian march. Right. I'm not accusing you of anything, but I'm worried about the reaction to your presence. Because I'm Jewish, I can't cross the road. Because of the march. Yeah, because I'm Jewish. That is part of, unfortunately, part of the fact. So the crux of this is the fact that he's been described in a way of being openly Jewish, Camilla, and that is part of the factor of why he couldn't cross. What the, Mr Falter was saying as the person in question was, I shouldn't feel uncomfortable to be mm. able to cross the road. It's my right to be able to cross the road. Yeah, I mean, for context, I think it's important to realise that he was just going about his daily business that morning and stumbled on the march, and the geography of the march has changed from week to week. And so I think he was in Aldwych, and as you say, Ben, he'd been at the synagogue in the morning and was wanting to get back home. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can all agree that the police have had an extremely difficult job policing this march week in, week out for the last six months. And equally, I think it's very difficult for the police when people are capturing footage on mobile phones. And I think Mr Falter himself, who is a campaigner against anti-Semitism, he's the CEO of the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism, so he knows his onions when it comes to sort of the observation of Jew hate, which appears to have been on the rise in recent months um, and weeks. Um, I think he doesn't say that he's got any truck necessarily with the officers themselves, but I think our reaction to it is that it was mishandled. I think um, we can understand why the police officer wanted to protect a man wearing a kippah, wearing a skull cap, mm -hmm. in the middle of a hostile environment. When the Prime Minister talks about the footage being appalling, he's also talking about the footage of people shouting at Mr Falter, scum and Nazi. Um, which is more than appalling in my yeah. mind to shout that at an observant Jew trying to get about his ba daily life in London. Um, my question would be, why did the police officer not think to himself, well, this man could be made a target in that kind of environment, therefore it's our job to actually safely escort him through the march so he can get home. Later on, the footage shows that this man, Mr Falter, was threatened with arrest. Um, just for being there, which seems rather iniquitous when you consider that those who were shouting scum and Nazi didn't face that threat of arrest. So what we see is a lack of equilibrium here in the policing of that particular moment of the march, which has echoed criticisms, mm -hmm. not least from Home Secretary Suella Braverman, who thinks that the police are picking sides and that there's two-tier policing. And now we've obviously seen these calls for Metropolitan Police Commissioner Mark Rowley to go because, you know, vicariously, he's responsible for the actions of his officers. Mm. Uh, Mr Fulton was talking on Good Morning Britain this morning, Ashley, and he reiterated his, felt, his feeling, which is that Mark Rowley should step down because of the scenario and what's been going on. Not just this incident, but how difficult he's saying it has been for the Jewish community uh, through all of this. I think um, my heart goes out to everyone in the Jewish community because obviously we know that anti-Semitism is on the rise and I know lots of my own Jewish friends 
do feel really worried mm. ab about the marches. But what I would say is these are in large peaceful protests. There are lots of Jewish people who go to these marches. So let's not confuse what the marches are. They are protesting against what's happening in Gaza and the Israeli government, not Jewish people. And, I, you know, there are Jewish people at these marches. So I think the police officer, it seemed, had good intentions, even though I condemn the way in which he handled it. But we've we actually see got... It... Sorry, Ashley, just to interrupt. We've got a little bit more footage. So the, fo the initial clip was the clip that Mr Fulton posted, which was with the incendiary words that were used in a very, described a very clumsy way, the Prime Minister described mm. as the whole thing as sort of appalling. About 12 minutes in total is the footage of the whole interaction. Yeah. Here's a bit more footage, which is the policeman doing exactly what you're saying, clearly trying to find a way to navigate a very help. difficult scenario and help Mr Fulter cross the road as he wished to do. I will walk you out and then you can go. You can see all the Israeli flags over there. I'll walk over there. I don't want to walk with the Israeli flags or any flags. I just want to walk No, I'm not asking you to walk with them, but that's the route. I'll take you out. You're telling me that I cannot walk to the other people. I'm telling you that I will help you by escorting you over there. And that way you will be completely safe, just as we promised. So we're keeping our word. So the battle for the police is to make sure that the march goes off peacefully, but also those who are coming alongside the march also are kept safe as well. But if the, I think the my march was being peaceful, though, if the march was entirely peaceful, then Mr Fulter and the police wouldn't have had a problem crossing it. I agree I with you. I think the that... problem is it's like football matches. For the large part, they are safe, but there are always but bad people. And, yes, I agree and with Nazi, you, by the way, that those people who peaceful. do... No, but there are always those people, and those people should be dealt with. I'm not excusing the language, but I think what's frustrating, and Rishi Sunak's obviously come out and condemned it, but Rishi Sunak and his government are the same people who are condemning woke training, and woke training is exactly what this would be. It would be giving the police the language to use to avoid scenarios like this, to avoid clumsiness like this, and that is exactly what wokeness is. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, feel, I feel for this man, it's horrific. I can't imagine coming out and minding about my business and being told, essentially, that I can't be there based on my faith or my ethnicity. Um, but I think in this situation, the marches are peaceful. Yes, but, we should condemn those who come and cause disturbances or use bad language. Largely by them. I mean, I've got Jewish friends Jews, who go to the marches. There are a few Jews on the marches. The predominance of the people at the marches are non-Jewish. And secondly, research by the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism and the CSJ and other, um, or CST rather, the Community Security Trust, and other Jewish charities have found that a majority of Jews in London feel intimidated mm. by the marches. Mm. So the intent of most people on the marches may be peaceful, but the consequences that Jewish people feel intimidated by them. Jewish people are saying, you know, we can't really go into London because yeah. we don't know when we might face, no one you know, a, 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 a mob of people who are, at times, have been known to be chanting things like from the river to the sea. Um, and that's a deeply offensive chant for Jewish people to hear. So... OK. It's there's very a, I difficult. Think there's another march next weekend as well, of course, and I think Mr Falter is going to be walking with some other people and is invited. I think there's going to be about a 1,000 of his Israeli and Jewish friends or, or, or people based in the UK here that are sympathised with what they're going on. So there's, you know, there's essentially there's going to be a sort of a, a, a scenario that could go either way, yes. but the handling from the police perspective yeah. has to be very carefully done, doesn't it? And then that's the, yeah, that's the absolutely. point. Absolutely. Um, the second story of the day, uh, one London school is attempting to get teenagers off their phones and break their tech obsession by asking them to come to school for a full 12 hours a day. Oh, God, this seems uh, extreme. It'll start at 7am, end at 7pm. It costs £2.50 per child. They get a meal included. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds like work? a bargain. I mean, it depends whether you're an advocate of the school day being that long. Mm -hmm. I mean, the school day is sort of that um, 8.45 to 3.15 because it still reflects the Industrial Revolution of children mm -hmm. leaving early and going back into the factories. And some people have said, you know, it should be more of a 9 to 5, which might be more helpful, helpful to working parents. Yep. And I think we know that a lot of schools do offer before school and after school mm -hmm. clubs. And in terms of extracurriculars, you know, as a mother, I'd rather my children were out and about playing sports or inside playing board games or just chatting and conversing face to face with their peers rather than being on their phones. But it seems a bit sad that a teacher is having to come up with a 12 hour school day to try and solve this issue. Mm -hmm. Ashley? 
Uh, so my son's starting preschool in September and I'm thinking at the moment about whether or not he would do one of these um, paid after-school clubs, not so much because he's on his phone, but because of working hours. So I think this is a great thing in general because, as you mentioned, how are people, how are families meant to cope when the school day is shorter than the working day and you can't get flexible working, whatever it might be. But I think I don't like the assumption that everyone is just on their phone at night because I think it does a disservice to parents. I actually, and also £2.50 a day, it sounds really cheap, but actually five days a week, or I think this one's four days a week, it does all add up. Mm -hmm. And we, we know that childcare is expensive. We know that, um, you know, it's a huge sum of money, especially in a cost of living crisis. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually think we should be looking at longer hours to fit working parents yeah. anyway, where you're not having to pay. Yeah. Um, but obviously it is a great initiative. I would much rather my son to be playing with his friends, doing painting and crafts than if he were to come home where I might have to work. So he might just be sat on his own. OK, well, we've got the uh, head teacher, Andrew, Andrew O'Neill, on the line. Uh, He's from All Saints Catholic College. Good morning, morning Andrew. Andrew. Mr. O'Neill. How are Good you? Good morning. Good morning. So what's nice the, to be here. What's the motivation behind this 12-hour day? Well, I, I think there's a, a few things that I should probably point out and make clear. Um, firstly, it, it's not compulsory, mm -hmm. and it's a pilot for Year 7 and 8 children, so the youngest year groups at the school. They don't have to come to the breakfast. Um, the breakfast starts from about 7, 7.15. We had about 25 children in this morning. That, that's optional, but we're increasingly finding that more and more children come to school early. And then at the end of the day, we offer an opportunity for children to get their homework done. We're providing one-to-one -one tuition services. Some of that we're buying in. Uh, and then extracurricular activities after that, including multiple sports clubs, um, cooking, drama, uh, oracy opportunities. Mm -hmm and ending it with a hot meal at the end of the school day where they get to sit together and chat and have effectively meaningful and purposeful conversations with one another and hopefully go home from school absolutely buzzing from a wonderful school day. Uh, probably a little bit tired as well. I mean, 12 <laughs> hours of all of that intense exchange and, and oratory experience is going to be full on. <laughs> is all of this, Andrew, is all of this specifically with the intent of getting them off their phones? That's one of the drivers. So they're interacting with each other, not digitally with, with games or whatever's going on on their smartphones. I think I think phones is one part, and obviously the, the newspapers have picked up on the phone aspect. That's just one part. But I think something we've seen post-COVID is sort of sense of belonging lacking from aspects of society. And, you know, we, we see that really phones, mobile phones often fill the vacuum where children aren't, say, participating in sports. You know, if we look at private schools, for example, lots of families clamour to pay for their children to have a private education where at the end of the school day they're doing homework and they're doing prep work and they're participating in sports. No, why can't we have this in the state sector? It's it's of great benefit to young people. And can I just ask about the price? It's two pound yeah. fifty voluntary for people to come along. That seems extraordinarily cheap for what you're offering. How are you making that work? Because I'd imagine that the the addition in terms of the supervision and the activities and the food is going to be quite a hefty bill on the school. Absolutely. If if you look at the last fifteen years uh, of what we've seen with austerity. And, and, and in my view, a lack of really strident education policy in this area and a cost of living crisis. You know, families in, in the context I'm in, which is, you know, quite challenging, but highly aspirational, families can't afford after school cl clubs that cost 20, 30 pounds uh, an hour, mm. particularly when, you know, their children are sort of 11, 12, 13 years old and they will allow yeah. them to go home. And as I said, mobile phones fill the vacuum. So, you know, I've made it as cheap as humanly possible and we've really made the cost so that there is a buy-in from the families. Obviously, I've got to fit this into my school budget yeah. and with the pressure we all know about there, that has been extraordinarily difficult. But yeah. I, I see this as a key, key priority to make sure that we actually offer that broad, balanced education to our young people. Well, look, okay, it sounds like a, a really interesting pilot scheme. We'll look forward yes. to seeing what the results were as well. Thanks, uh, but Mr. we'll let you get back to Scott. Are you mid? Should you be teaching a class at the moment, or as head teacher, are you allowed to have your feet up and have a cup of tea right now? <laughs> well, I might have to have a cup of tea after this interview. <laughs> <don't wanna see. laughs> Thanks, Mr. O'Neill. Thank you. you. Fascinating um, to understand what your thoughts at home. Yeah. I do get in touch.
Uh, is it the sort of thing you'd like to see your children being able to? 12 hours is a long old day, but it is. sounds like he's got a really sort of yeah. brilliant intent. You get to hang out it. with your friends. Yeah. yeah, and you get a meal. I don't know. Sounds pretty it's good. It's homework done before you get home exactly. as well. That's never a bad thing, right? Uh, don't go anywhere. There's more from Camilla and Ashley coming your way next, including what they make of the pub that's banned children but accepts dogs. Dogs behave better than kids, in my experience. <laughs> better than my Yours dogs. are older better now. Better than mine. Yeah. Uh, later on, we've got another chance to ask our GP, Dr. Sarah, is taking your calls in the phone. In morning, Sarah, what are we after today? Good morning. I'd love to hear from you if you've got any aches and pains. I bet you would have if you've got if you've been running the marathon. And um, any coughs, colds, rashes, lumps, bumps, and as always, if you have a photo or a video to support your question, that'd be really helpful. Great. To ask Dr. Sara a question, give us a call for free on 08000 30 40 44 or scan the QR code on your screen now to get involved using our free this morning app. Please get in touch by 11.15 and you must be 18 or over. Uh, stay with us. You're watching This Morning Live on ITV1 and ITVX. <laughs>